In our last video, we uncovered some horrifying secrets within the bowels of Sugar Grove, a pre-war government intelligence facility. There, we found reams of data related to the government's Pulsar program, which sadly was not finished before the bombs dropped. But the data was complete enough that Kryptos was able to produce the voice of Set for us on the fabricator. With the voice of Set, we have completed our Mistress of Mystery regalia. We achieved the rank of Seeker, and we were were able to move on to our next and final mission. This mission was posted to the mission board by Shannon Rivers shortly before she and all of the other mistresses of mystery inexplicably disappeared. We heard in the council chamber holotape that after posting this mission to the mission board, she didn't assign it to anyone. Instead, she asked for volunteers. And that's because she considered this mission to be a suicide mission. The mission was to infiltrate the heart of Raider territory at the Pleasant Valley Ski Resort. But this was her only option. The mistresses of mystery were being killed one after another because for some reason the Raiders knew exactly where they were going to be. They were always one step ahead of the mistresses of mystery and Shannon Rivers had no idea why. It's clear that no one ever accepted this job, for we still find it on the job board all these years later. But now that we are a seeker, we can accept the job ourselves. And so we fast travel to the Pleasant Valley Station and head north to the ski resort to see if we can find any evidence that answers this one question. How were a bunch of filthy spoiled raiders winning against the Order of Mysteries? The train station here is another wonderful pit stop. Like all train stations, it has crafting benches and a number of dispensers, including an ammo and first aid dispenser, and it has a merchant, though this Protectron merchant still has its Raider programming. Reminder, any attempted five-finger discounts will be reclaimed and paid for with said fingers. Here we can break down our scrap and even access our stash. Just south of here is the South Cutthroat Camp. We explored the North Cutthroat Camp when we were looking for the materials needed to craft the Phantom Device. Instead of mole miners, here we find a bunch of super mutants. Of note, we find a zero skill locked box safe to the southeast, an end of dungeon steamer truck by a ruined car, and in the car, an iron throne, and on top of it, the Endurance Bobblehead. To the north, we find a blasted open safe with an ammo box inside near to a gondola that had been converted into a toilet. In a ruined gondola to the east, we find yet another box safe, this time skill level 2 locked. And after looting the camp of ammunition and scrap, we can head back to the train station to break it down before moving north to the Pleasant Valley Ski Resort. We can take the short way by climbing up a rocky hill to get there, or take the road, which eventually wraps back around to the ski resort. And once we do, we find that super mutants have moved down. The road into Pleasant Valley is surrounded by an old raider gate that the mutants make great use of. They'll hide in the towers and snipe from the nearby rocks. Besides the tuba in the middle of this area, there's nothing much here. Moving through the secondary gate, we see that it was booby-trapped with a bunch of flamers. Looks like the super mutants have already triggered them. The raiders had made little homes for themselves. We see their bunk beds, posters, toys, and gear laid out. In one of these nooks, we find a duffel bag and an armor workbench. Pleasant Valley has a lot of workbenches, giving us ample opportunity to break down all of our junk. On the other side of the second gate is the primary lodge. The building to the south is all boarded up, though if we're tricky, we can use a nearby bush to jump on the rooftop where we find a number of containers, skeletons, and duffel bags to loot. The building to the north is comprised of two wings, one of which is boarded up, but the other is the primary lodge. The ski resort is right next to Top of the World. Top of the World is an important stop we'll be making when we follow the primary plot of the game so we won't be going there today. But right next to Top of the World is the Lodge itself, and we begin to see where the Cutthroat Raiders got their logo. Right outside Top of the World is a marketing sign promoting Cutthroat Crag, a deadly and dangerous ski slope, which is why the owners of this resort put a skull on the mountain to advertise their slope. But after the apocalypse, at least one faction of the Raiders, the Cutthroat faction, took the logo from this slope and the name. 
the cutthroats, which is why we find it spray-painted all over the place in the ruins of their camps. After looting some chem boxes outside, we can disarm some chimes and head in through the main door. The second floor has partially collapsed, forming a ramp. Beneath the ramp, we find a chem cooler and a bobblehead. There's nothing behind the reception counter. Before going up, let's fully explore this floor. We see the raiders had fun defacing many of the pre-war posters. The door next to this wall is a storage closet. Here we find a couple of containers and we see a hole in the wall leading to another section of the resort. But we can't squeeze through, making this a dead end. We need to find a way over there. So, heading over to the rebel ramp, we can scale it to the second floor. Heading through the door, we see ourselves in a hallway above a trading post pointing downstairs. We'll check that out in a minute. These must have been some of the resort rooms, but they're all boarded up. Heading out to the ledge, we can loot a cooler on a table, and we see a pre-war skeleton lying on the ground. And following the balcony all the way west until we're in the shadow of Top of the World, we find an End of Dungeon steamer trunk hidden in a corner by a duffel bag. From this ledge, we can do a run and jump to the balcony of the boarded up building we passed upon entry. But sadly, our only reward for our effort is one duffel bag. I tried to get on the rooftop above this, but despite multiple attempts, I couldn't get there. Back on the balcony of the main lodge, we can head back inside. We discover that the stairway leading up is boarded up, so we can take the stairs down towards this trading post. Here we find a ski sword on the ground next to a porta diner where we can try our luck. No dice. Before heading into the training post, we can move east. Here we find an employee's office. We can turn off the radio to avoid demonetization. We see another promotional poster for uncanny caverns on the wall. And on a table nearby, we find another bobblehead. Right next to a holotape, next to a blasted out terminal labeled Harlan's up to no good. They're talking crap about you again, David. This time, I'm gonna record them so you can hear it yourself. Let me pause right here to say that this has to be a mistake. The subtitles say that this is Frederick Rivers, but the exact same voice came from Harland McClintock just a sentence previously, and Maggie in this holotape referred to him as Harland. So yeah, it does say Frederick Rivers here, but that has got to be a mistake, especially considering we heard Frederick Rivers' voice in holotapes back at Riverside Manor. Anyway, to continue. So we're listening to a holotape of Raiders after the apocalypse. Harland and Margie are married, or they're a couple, and we get the impression that Margie has power. Harlan said that the people chose her to lead them. They're both upset about another raider named David, who apparently murdered people. So here we have two raiders, Harland and Margie, who don't like murder? But Margie appears to be the one in power. She says that she's going to put David on trial and exile him for his crimes. Since when do raiders exile each other for murder? And to top it all off, we were listening to a recording of a recording of Margie and Harland. This was a holotape recorded by someone named Rosalind Jeffries, which she then sent to David. So David knew exactly what Margie and Harland were planning. 
While exploring this office, we found the pre-war Pleasant Valley Work Administration Terminal. Welcome to Pleasant Valley Ski Resort, Grand Lodge Network Administration. We find two options. First, we'll explore the intramail, where we find a number of messages all after the war. So the raiders here at Pleasant Valley have been using this network for their own purposes. In the first one, November 16th, 2086, regarding the community message board, from T. Larmy to T. Lagren. I know you don't want to keep scrubbing the message board, but damn it, these rumors are getting out of hand. I am not seeing Davy. I wouldn't be caught dead with that half-wit. Look, Tony, I can make it worth your while. Just lock Mark out of the system for a couple of days. Hell, with all the problems we've been having lately, you can just say it's more network trouble. Is Davy the same Dave we heard about on the holotape? The same Dave who murdered people for their measly supplies? But we learn that the Raiders were suffering from network trouble. Let's see if we can learn more in the next one, two days later, intranet from Jay Early to T. Lagrin. Hey, Tony, I'm having trouble accessing my intramail. Could you swing by and check my terminal? All right, so this must be Tony's terminal, and he must have been in charge of the Raider network here at Pleasant Valley. In the next one, the same day, intranet's down from A. Harrison to Tony Lagrin. Hey, dork face, intranet's broke. Fourth time this month. Think you can get it back for an entire week this time? Whew, imagine being the guy responsible for keeping a Raider network up. Make no mistake, in the next one, again the same day, Alex's post from R. Talon to Tony Lagrin. I'm with Alex. You need to get your stuff together, man, or someone's gonna beat it out of you. That must be in response to a message we haven't read yet. We'll see if we can find it later. In the final one the next day, memo from D. Thorpe to Tony Lagren. Mr. Lagren, this morning I received a memo addressed to all you jokers. While I recognize that the current network situation may be a source of considerable frustration, I do not appreciate being addressed in this manner by my subordinates. Meet me in my office in the top at 2.30. There are some things we need to discuss. Okay, a lot going on here. This reads like a pre-war message that we would find in some ruins, but it's not. It's written in 2086 by D. Thorpe, and we can only presume by now that D stands for David. So this was by David Thorpe, the same David we learned in the holotape who murdered some people. He's talking to Tony here like an employee, and his complaint is that he didn't like the way Tony was talking to him. What, because raiders don't cuss? <laughs> Sounds like what we're supposed to believe. Anyway, these raiders were really giving Tony a hard time for the network. Bunch of spoiled little brats. One thing doesn't go their way and they just throw a hissy fit. But the final nugget we can get from this is that David told Tony to meet him at the top of the world at 2.30. But we got the impression from the holotape that Margie was in charge of the raiders. She, after all, was gonna try to get David exiled. Why then is David giving orders in this terminal entry, instructing Tony to meet him at Top of the World, where the Raider boss hangs out? We need more pieces of the puzzle to put together this story. Backing out of Intramail, we can access Network Administration. Mainframe Intranet and Operation Status, error, error, error. Lots of error codes there. Multiple system faults detected. Please contact a Robco licensed service technician for assistance. The following actions are available. Reset user passwords. And we see a whole lot of names. Every single raider who was part of this gang. And we get a few of our questions answered. A. Harrison was indeed Alex Harrison. And D. Thorpe was indeed David Thorpe. The only David listed here. Though we do find a Davy Burnett. So Davy and David were not the same person. Now we can reset the password for every raider in this network, but every time we do, we get a message saying, unable to access the selected account. Please ensure that the user has an active valid account and try again. Until we change the password for a one Brody Torrance. If we change his password, we get the new password added to our inventory. Brody, wait a minute, Brody, we recognize that name. Brody was the name of the raider who gave Kerry his orders to assassinate Natasha Hunt at Lewisburg. Brody was the name of the raider who met the mysterious young woman at the presidential cottage at the White Spring Resort. Brody, the name of the raider to whom the young woman told that Natasha Hunt would even be at Lewisburg. So Brody was the point of contact between the Raider gang here at Pleasant Valley and whomever was betraying the Order of Mysteries. 
and we now have a password to his terminal. Let's see if we can track it down. Heading out from this office, we can go into the shop. We find a bunch of costumes and ski swords around, and the raider vendor bot. We can sell our goods and purchase some plans. And if we go behind the counter, we find yet another bobblehead on a shelf next to some teddy bears. Here we also find a resort manager's terminal. Inside we find a bunch of terminal entries from 2076 and 2077. So we've got two stories being told here. First is the pre-war story about the resort and how it functioned before the bombs dropped. And the other is the post-war story about the raiders who ended up living here after the bombs dropped. This terminal is the pre-war story. In the first one, January 10th, 2077, to Carl Beltran, facilities manager from Karen Gerard, operations manager. Carl, we've had a terribly mild winter, so I was wondering if you could consider running the snowmakers overnight for the next three weeks. Guests at the resort have been complaining that the powder just isn't ideal for skiing, and we don't want them heading home thinking about going someplace else next time. I realize this will put a strain on the units, but we must do everything we can to make our guests feel like they're at the premier resort for Appalachia. Over two months later, to Sarah Siegfried, again from Karen Gerard, I got your mail, Sarah. Believe me, I am well aware that the slopes we have at Pleasant Valley are not exactly Olympic caliber, but we must make do with what we have. That's why I would like to get some input into changing Trail C to something more exciting. That trail certainly isn't challenging, but I think if we upscale the marketing on it, we can give the impression that it's dangerous. I was toying around with ideas and I came up with Cutthroat Crag. Do you think you could mock up a flyer pushing this new idea and go over it with me tomorrow? I see. So it wasn't really a deadly ski slope. It was all just a big marketing push. And Sarah was the one who came up with the marketing materials. Little did she know that the logo that she would make for Cutthroat Crag would become the icon of a bloodthirsty and remorseless raider gang decades later. And the next one is in August of the same year. To Carl Beltran, again from Karen Gerard, this must have been Karen's terminal, did you switch on the snowmakers or did we have a freak blizzard last night? The entire area is covered in fresh powder, which is unusual. Well, almost impossible for this time of year. Either way, the timing couldn't be better. We have a VIP guest who just rented out the entire facility to take advantage of the fresh snow. I'm gonna need you to get on the phone to get everyone in here right away. We need to be up and running in two days. I know that doesn't leave your team with much time, but do the best you can, and I'll see that everyone gets a bonus. Wow, someone rented out the entire resort? That's some VIP. Going forward in time to September, from Sarah Siegfried to Karen Gerard, as I'm sure you're aware, the Pheasants on the Run event had mixed results. I'm not sure how you talked me into this event, but having guests ski down shenanigan trying to hunt pheasant was not only ridiculous, but dangerous. That being said, we did have the highest attendance in ski rental sales on Thanksgiving in the last several years. Oh, and before I forget, could you please send a get well soon bouquet to the poor guest that accidentally wiped out when her ski caught one of the five pounders? Thanks. So these guys were hunting pheasants while skiing down a mountain? On Thanksgiving? Well, when you have too much money and not enough brains. But that's it for 2076. The next one is in February of 2077. To Carl Beltran from Karen Gerard. I'm only gonna say this once. So you might want to print this mail and tack it to your wall. I rode the little lifts this morning and was absolutely appalled at their condition. Not only were they noisy and vibrated terribly, but they were filthy as well. I found empty champagne bottles shoved between the seats on my car and some rich spoiled brat carved his initials into the plastic. This is unacceptable. You and your team have a week to get the lifts back into peak condition or you'll be hunting for a job somewhere else. So this was Karen's office before the war and the Raiders turned it into a bit of a robot-powered trading post. Sounds like she ran a tight ship here, though she might not have respected her own clientele. Heading out, we can take a staircase down to another employees only section. And here we find a red laser grid. This is an important quest destination during the Raider quest line of the primary plot to the game. And so it's something we'll explore much later when I cover that story. But for now, we need to move on. And we find no way out other than to go back the way we came, back out the main entrance. We found a password to Brody's terminal, which I think will be important. 
but now we have to find that terminal. To do so, we need to travel north from the resort and follow the road up the hill to the resort's cabins. Walking through the parking lot, we find a patio with a fire pit and inside a bunch of human skeletons. After looting a chem box, we can open the big double doors to discover that the entire front entrance to this cabin has collapsed. We see a raider corpse sitting in a chair nearby, and heading out to the patio, we get rushed by Scorched. Back on the patio, we find a handwritten note. Lewisburg Ambush. You hear about the ambush down on Lewisburg? Another one of those girls. They had the drop on her, and she still managed to take out half of Carrie's crew before they brought her down. Got the old man himself, too. He still owed me for poker last week. Think there are any caps left in his stash? And this answers our question. If you remember in my video about Lewisburg, I tried to reconstruct the scene by examining the position of Carrie's body and the bodies of his raider gang, and also the body of Natasha Hunt. Remember we saw that streak of blood leading to the wall that she propped her body against. She did manage to kill Carrie and his entire raider crew before dying herself. And we have more confirmation that the raiders knew she was coming. We heard Brody get the tip in the holotape we found in the presidential cottage, and the author of this note flat out says it here. So who gave Brody the tip? Looks like someone was giving a sermon out here or a lecture. If we sneak near to the petrified corpse standing at the lectern, we find a weapon mod and some right away. Moving into the ruins of this cottage, we can go behind the desk. On a table nearby, we find Geraldine Fitzsimmons holotape. It's been barely a week since the bombs fell, and supplies have become scarce. The former guests at the resort are exploring the feasibility of sending out scavenging groups to hunt down whatever they can find. What's starting to dawn on us is that there will be people outside the resort sending groups of their own. Who knows if they'll be friendly or simply take what they want. Instead of waiting to find out, we've concluded that our goods should be locked up for safekeeping. It's a smart move, and one that will keep our belongings protected until the government rescue teams arrive. It's good to know that there's still some rationality left amongst all this chaos. Whoa. I get the impression that Geraldine was a former resort employee, based on the way she described the former guests of the resort, but it sounds like she and those former guests were what, creating scavenging teams to try and survive in the post-apocalypse? And we get the impression that early on, they stored their most valuable goods somewhere at the resort, possibly in that laser grid guarded room we found in the basement of the trading post. But sadly, I won't be able to open that for you until my video on the Raider story of Fallout 76. Near to here, by a jukebox, we find another handwritten note, The Assassins. Yeah, I can't believe it either. To think a couple of girls in that crazy getup carried out all those hits. I mean, sure, I've killed a couple of people, roughed up a lot more, but their body count must be off the charts. And we never even caught a glimpse of them before this. Still, you have to admit, it's pretty funny to think we've been cowering from a couple of teenagers in Halloween costumes. The diehards must be laughing their asses off. So someone told the Raiders that the Order of Mysteries was a bunch of young women, possibly in an attempt to what? Give them confidence? Heading up the ramp, we find a Raider corpse on a billiard table. Turning around and moving southwest across the ramp, we can move to a balcony where we find another end of dungeon steamer trunk and more Raider corpses. Using the nearby staircase, we can climb to the top ruins of this floor, where we find a chem box. Back down to the floor below, we can move to the eastern section by the pool table, where we find another handwritten note on a console. Harvey's Deal. Yo! You freaked out about all those mysterious assassins slinking around in the shadows? Afraid your crew is gonna be hit next? Your old pal Harvey has just the thing. Missile launcher to the face. One shot from my little beauty, and all that's left of the girl will be a smoking crater. I'm looking for a new gig. Double cut of the loot, and I'm yours. Hit me up if you want to talk. Harvey. So Harvey was trying to market his missile launcher skills to join a new crew of this raider gang. But he wanted a double cut of the loot? I bet they didn't sit very well with the other raiders. It seems that despite learning that the Order of Mysteries was comprised of young women, many of the raiders here were still, quote, freaked out. 
Moving out of this ruined room, we see another note lying on the ground, but our quest marker blinks in the nearby house. We'll get the one on the ground in a minute. Taking the scramp bridge to the nearby roof, we find yet another bobblehead on a ham radio and a purified water. Here we have to take care of more Scorched. Turning off the radio to avoid demonetization, we can loot a copy of Drakenak the Barbarian issue number six, lying on the bed's headboard, Enter Mwala, War Maiden of Mars. And on the nightstand, we find the next note. Tony's orders. Tony. Brody said his girl came through. He has the tape. Head over to his room and start digging. If this really is what he claims it is, we can finally put an end to this order of mysteries. Thorpe. This was from David Thorpe to Tony Lagren. Remember, we read on the terminal inside the resort that Tony Lagren was the Raiders IT guy for lack of a better word. He was responsible for keeping their network running, which is why they were all angry at him. And it was David Thorpe who told Tony to come to Top of the World after Thorpe sent out an angry, expletive-laden intramail to all of the other raiders. Sounds like Tony survived that interview with David. If David then sent him to deal with a holotape that Brody got from his girl. What did Brody need with the holotape? Why did he have to get that holotape from his girl? What was David hoping to find on it? Opening the northwestern door leads to a deck. From here, we can take some stairs down to the ground floor. This was a lobby. We can loot some clipboards behind the counters and other scrap. Heading out the door, we find a bus stop where we can loot some chems and an imported Chinese panda bear. Surprised to find that here. And from here, we see a road leading up to more cabins to the east. But remember, there was that final note. We need to go around to the back of this cabin to find the last note. Along the way, we find a porta diner and we again fail. And in the garbage by a trash can, we find the final note. Jake's note. Snake. You sure you don't want in? Hawk said those girls never hit the same checkpoint twice. That makes North safer than wherever it is they have you these days. Think on it, all right? Jake. So a raider trying to save his friend. Trying to get his friend, Snake, to join his raider crew, which had already been hit by the Order of Mysteries. But that's it for the notes we find in this cabin, and the notes gave us all the clues we needed. The note from David Thorpe to Tony told us that Brody had a holotape that he got from his girl. We need to get our hands on that holotape. We need to explore the cabin just down the hill from here to the northwest. Now, there are two ways we can get in. The first way is to climb across these raider tarps and jump atop the roof of the nearby shack. Then from here, we can do a running jump to the balcony right outside Brody's room. We find our raider corpse out here, and the back door is locked with a skill level one lock. Picking it gains us access to Brody's room. But that's the shortcut, and we're not about shortcuts here. If we fail the jump or we're just too encumbered, we arrive on a little road going between the cabins. These were market stalls where the raiders were hawking some of their goods. We can walk through one and drop down to another stall beneath where we find our raider corpse. And heading back to the road, we can walk northeast between other stands to find a trail leading to a staircase at the back of this cabin. Climbing the staircase to the second floor, we find a bank of terminals. And on the table, we find Holden McMerrick's holotape. Ever since the bombs dropped, the former guests at the ski resort have lost their minds. If being a member of the honorary mock naval yachting society has taught me one thing, it's that preparation is the key to survival. The idiots here have locked up their belongings and split up the access key, stashing away valuable items we could be using for barter. Every decision being made is foolish. Instead of using this facility as a headquarters and sending out hunting parties to look for scraps, we need to find a new base of operations. We should band together in larger groups and take anything we find along the way. They're convinced the government is going to rescue them, but the, the truth of the matter is, we're on our own. The only people that can help us now are ourselves. So the rich guests at this resort thought the government was going to save them. They locked up all of their valuables and split up the key. They then banded together, turned this place into a headquarters, and sent out scavenger parties. But Holden here thought they should form larger groups to take, quote, anything they find along the way. What? Like raiders? 
Also on this table, we find a weapon blueprint. I found a plan for the M2 light machine gun. If we move into the next room, we find a beer hat on a table. A pretty uncommon hat. I've only found three of these things so far. And when this top level besides Brody's room is explored, we can read the common room terminal. This is the community message board we read about on Tony's terminal in the first one poker night. Yo, we got Monday Night Poker down in the motel. Starts at sundown, ends when the suckers run out of caps. 25 to 50 cap blinds, don't be late. In the next one, Intranet Down. Hey, Intranet Down for anyone else? I haven't been able to log in since Sunday. This is, what, four times this month? This happens again. I'd like to get some friends together and pay a visit to Tony over in the main lodge. Let me know if you're in and what weapons you want to bring. Alex. I can read these posts, dumbass. Tony. So this was the post that our Talon was referring to when she sent a message to Tony saying, I'm with Alex. These spoiled little raiders really flipped a gasket when their precious intranet went down. But I wonder why it went down. In the next one, opening South Checkpoint, Boss Thorpe is looking for a crew to take over the South Checkpoint next spring. You want in? Let me know. Rose. Well, this tells us what those North and South Cutthroat camps were. They were road checkpoints where the gangs would likely strip travelers of their goods, if not murder them. And this confirms something we suspected when we heard the very first holotape. In that first holotape, a woman named Rosalind recorded a conversation she overheard between Margie and Harland about wanting to exile David for murdering people. She then sent the holotape directly to David. We got the impression that Margie was in charge of the Raider gang here, since she talked about putting him on trial and exiling him. But now, we see someone named Rose, which must be short for Rosalind, I bet this is the same person, referring to David Thorpe as boss. We must conclude that when David caught wind of Margie's attempt to exile him, he and his supporters, including Rosalind, a.k.a. Rose, likely his girlfriend, giving her motive so she could be closer to power, overthrew Margie and Harland and took control for himself. This is why he's now called boss in this terminal. This is why he called Tony up to top of the world for a scolding. And this is why he ordered Tony to help Brody with the holotape Brody got from his girlfriend. But whatever happened to Margie and Harland? We'll learn more when we explore the Raider plot to the game. In the next one, Lost Item. Anyone seen my missile launcher? Red paint job, black skulls, got my name scratched into the grip. I set it down in the stance while I was having it out with nails after the arena match last weekend. Some bastard must have swiped it. Get it back to me by Monday and we are good. No questions asked. After that, if I ever find out who took it, you're getting an express trip down the ski lift. Harvey. Ooh, does this mean we find a missile launcher with red paint in our future? We'll have to keep our eyes peeled. In the next one, Roommate Wanted. Carrie kicked it during the raid in Lewisburg last week, so I need a new roommate. Got a nice place up in Snowdrift Lodge. Second floor, balcony overlooking the arena, pool table in the common room. You'd be splitting the rent with me, Derek, and Brick, 55 a month. Drop me a line if you're interested. Mark. This must have been that lodge we visited recently with the pool table in it. Interesting that the raiders were all paying rent to stay here. I wonder if it all went to David at the top of Top of the World. In the next one, yo Brody! Yo Brody, you missing something? I think you left your bag in the motel after last night's poker game. Got your keys in it and everything. Come snag it before someone else does. Oh no, this means Brody's room is locked. And if we can't pick it, we'll have to go get the key. And in the final one, arena schedule. Books are open for this Saturday's arena. Place your bets with Nails, Tara, or Rocky. Betting closes at 11 sharp before the fight. This week's matchup are... One-Eyed Pete versus Rabbit Ralph, 3-2 odds. Two old toughs duke it out in this no-holds-barred grudge match. Davy versus Chitters, odds 18 to 1. Can our boy Davy stomp his Firecrest foe yet? Watch him square off with Chitters, the terrifying Rad Roach. <laughs> so this is why the girl was embarrassed that someone said she was dating him on the digital bulletin board. Steel Sisters versus Ironclad, odds 2 to 5. The arena's a Soltron ladies are up against their stiffest challenge yet. Hawk's refurbished sentry bot. Who's got the metal metal to take home the metal? Uh -huh. I see what you did there. Nice. And in the final one, Irina versus Cinder. 
Odds one to one. In our title bout, Irina, our very own mad mistress of the machete, takes on Cinder, ghoulish brute of the Blackwater Bandits, in a brawl that's certain to have you on the edge of your seat. You don't want to miss this one. So there's an arena nearby. The same arena in the stands of which Harvey lost his missile launcher. We'll have to keep our eyes open. Sure enough, checking the door. Oh, it's a skill level three locked door. Remember, there is that skill level one locked door on Brody's balcony if you can make the jump. But if you can't, we now gotta head to the motel to find the key. <sighs> But first, I wanted to see if I could find Harvey's missile launcher at the arena. If we retrace our steps back to the road that we fell into, after failing the jump to the balcony, we pass by the market stalls, and sure enough, here we find an arena. And in the middle of the arena, we find a pile of raider corpses surrounding a suit of raider power armor. I came here at just the right level to make use of the raider power armor I found here. So this was quite a welcome find. I then explored the stands and the ramparts around the arena, but I never found Harvey's missile launcher, so I don't even know if it's in the game. Incidentally, the marketplace next to the arena has lots of crafting stations, and we find plans and recipes all over the place. But to continue with our quest, we need to turn around and take the road east towards the motel. There is a path to the northeast where we see some cabins. We'll explore those in a minute, continuing east up the hill towards the motel. We see the road to the right, which leads back to the primary lodge. And at this intersection, we find a boat. In the boat, we find a stealth boy and the corpse of a settler, not a raider. Lying next to her head is Phyllis's note. Mother, I hope you received my first letter. Things are getting worse here at the resort. These people around us, they don't seem to care about anyone else. I'm hearing them talk about hunting parties and heading to Charleston to take what they want. People are arguing, fighting. I even saw someone get shot. I'm scared, mother, and I want to go home. They say war brings out the worst in mankind. From what I've seen, nothing could be further from the truth. I think she meant to say nothing could be more accurate because to say that war bringing out the worst in people is further from the truth, then closer to the truth would mean that war brings out the best in people, which is not the message I think she's trying to send. Stay safe, Phyllis Mendelssohn. So wait a minute, are we to understand that the first raiding parties of Appalachia were rich people staying at wealthy resorts? Is that where the raiders came from? All these rich people out on vacation, the bombs drop, they store all their precious belongings, split up the password, divide themselves into gangs, and then begin raiding cities? Turning around from the boat and heading up the hill, we find the motel swarming with super mutants. After killing the super mutants in the motel, we find the duffel bag behind one of the diner benches to the northeast. Inside, we find Brody's room key. Turning southeast, we see a door that leads outside and a door that leads to a kitchen. In the kitchen, we find some recipes. Here I found some infused flour tea and a recipe for a blood bug pepper steak. Heading behind the front desk, we don't see any keys on the rack, but we do find a 44 and a skill level two locked wall safe. Heading out before we go back to Brody's room, we can open up some of the motel rooms. In one, we find a footlocker beneath a bunk bed, a bathroom with a bathtub filled with chems, and that's it for the motel. Now, before we race back to access Brody's terminal, I want to finish telling the pre-war story of the ski resort, the story that gives us hints as to how the Appalachian Raiders were formed. Directly northwest of this motel, looking down the hill, we find a lodge filled with super mutants. And strangely enough, there are two ceiling-mounted turrets. One in the living room beneath a German five-pointed star, interesting, and one in the bedroom, directly above the bathroom. In the kitchen, we find a recipe for steep strangler pod tea on a stove and a recipe for infused blood leaf tea. And this is the place to hit if you want recipes. Then in the living room, we find games with nuclear material and on a coffee table, a sniper rifle and a duffel bag. Heading out to the porch, we see ruined chairs and rubble, not much, but then we see something glowing on the ground. What's that? Getting closer, we see that it's a holo tape, the stolen terminal passcode. Stolen terminal passcode? What is this? Heading into the bedroom, we find chems in the bathroom, a painting on the wall that says, take me to your cheese. Okay, 
raiders, man. And turning around, we find a note beneath a terminal. This is Trevor's note. Mike, I'm coming down to see the latest artifact as soon as I can. I'd like to bring an expert with me, Mr. Christopher Weed. I trust him, but a background check might be in order. We are getting close to the truth. Regards, Trevor. Artifact? This must be concerning something unrelated to the other storylines going on here at the moment. If we try to access his well-mounted terminal, welcome, Mr. Green. Warning, security system error. Credentials access required for key generation. Invalid credentials will activate hostile security systems. That must be referring to the turrets we destroyed a moment ago. And sure enough, we find an option below for turret control. We can choose to generate a one-time key. Access denied. Oh, I get it. I bet we have to load the stolen terminal passcode holotape into this terminal. But backing out and trying again, we don't even find an option to load any holotape. There's nothing we can do to use that holotape passcode with this terminal. What's going on here? And next to his bed is a skill level 3 locked box safe, which I didn't have the skill to pick at the time. This perplexed me. That's why I went all around the lodge trying to find any more information. On the northern side of the lodge, we see a bit of a porch. There's a bunch of stone and overgrowth under there. Uh, but wait a minute. Looks kind of deep back there. Crawling through, we find a concrete space. And against the concrete wall is a safe and a keypad. Here we stare at a number pad with no idea what to type. We can't load the stolen terminal passcode onto our Pip-Boy. We couldn't load it onto the terminal upstairs. Exactly where do we find the code for this keypad? This lodge is a crucial step in an elaborate, completely unmarked side quest. We're stumbling upon this shack near to the very end of the quest. The stolen terminal passcode we found on the deck is actually for some other terminal in the world. I can't cover it now, so I don't want to give away any spoilers. From that terminal, we can generate credentials that grant us access to Mr. Green's terminal in this lodge. And from that terminal, we can generate a completely unique access code for this number pad. The access code is unique to our own gameplay. We can't share it with anyone because it won't work for them. After inputting the code, we can open the safe to find. Well, I don't want to spoil it. I'll be sure to cover this enthralling unmarked side quest in a dedicated video a bit later. But now you know it's here. And we need to move on to finish exploring the Pleasant Valley cabins. Now remember when we traveled east up the road towards this motel, we saw a fork in the road, one leading down to the north where we saw three cabins. Heading down there to the cabins, we can explore them one by one. Here we find a number of recipes. I found a recipe for steeped melon blossom chai on a table. Heading into the first shack, in the first door to the left, we find a raider corpse and a duffel bag. In the first door to the right, we find a weapons workbench, a bunch of baseball grenades and an ammo canister. Turning around, we find the plans for a plasma gun medium night vision scope on a table. Back down the hallway, we find a tool case in the bathroom, and then into the main cabin, we find a recipe for fried deer skins by a sink, a raider corpse with his head in the fridge, and a bunch of board games on the tables with nuclear material. That's it for shack number one. Heading to cabin number two, we find another campfire outside. Here I found yet another recipe, this time for infused soot flower tea. We can pick off the scorched inside cabin number two. And then to enter, we have to pick its skill level zero locked door. Inside, we find more raider corpses, a foot locker, a first aid kit, and a wooden box by the beds. And that's it. So maybe we'll find our lore in cabin number three. Heading that way, we can loot some chems in a refrigerator and pre-war money on a table. Heading up the stairs, we can loot the bodies of some scorched we killed earlier. We find a few more containers and lying on the bed, Rory's holotape. I found the mother load, baby. Some bunker tucked away in the swamp. Yeah, I bet it's got supplies for at least a couple of years stashed away inside. Now it's just a matter of breaking in. But the damn girl holed up in there has got some, some sort of terminal controlling the locks on the door. <laughs> if I didn't suck at hacking, I'd be in there by now. Four tries and you're locked out. That's bullshit. But I'm gonna let anybody else know. 
That place and everything inside's mine. No sharing here. It's just a matter of getting that damn password. I just gotta wait for that Abbey chick to, to leave and then come back. Then I sneak in the door behind her. And bam! <laughs> She's dead. And I'm living the dream. All right, if you don't want people to know about your secret bunker, why record a holotape all about it? He is, of course, referring to Abby's bunker. But that's a location we'll visit as we continue with the primary quest. It is part of the Free States questline. On our way back to Brody's room, we find one more cabin that we hadn't explored. It has the words, keep out, spray painted on the outside. This is really near to the Raider Marketplace, close to the arena where we found the power armor. Heading inside, we can get rid of some scorched. And then on the top floor, by a bed, we find Chauncey's note. Dear Ludmilla, man, <laughs> these names. My darling, I don't think I'll be able to make it home in time for the winter festival you had planned at the estate. I know I promised I'd return right after my vacation at Pleasant Valley, but it appears all transportation services in the area have been disabled thanks to this troublesome war. But don't fret, my love. The government is certain to send a military unit to rescue us, and soon we'll be reunited. Oh, and until I arrive, don't forget to feed the peacocks. Love, Chauncey. These are the guys that eventually became raiders? <laughs> On a wall behind, we find a skill level 3 locked wall safe. And then heading down to the kitchen, we find a recipe for infused soot flower tea lying on a countertop. But that's it for this cabin. And with that, we've explored all of the cabins here at Pleasant Valley Ski Resort. Now we need to head back to Brody's room to unlock his door. Inside, we find a bed to the southwest. There is a skill level zero locked footlocker. Picking it, inside we find the Pleasant Valley intranet memo. To all of you jerks from Tony Lagrin. Subject, intranet. Yeah, I know the intranet's on the fritz again. I'm on it. If we ever find the bastard who installed this cut-rate piece of crap, I'll throttle him with his own coax cable. I'm probably gonna have to wipe the damn user logs again. If you get locked out of your terminal, come see me in the main lodge for your password reset. Until then, if you need to talk to someone, get off your ass and go find them. Okay, so this was the rather rude intranet mail that so offended Raider boss David after Tony sent it. If we never found Tony's terminal at the main lodge, then we find Brody's terminal locked with a skill level 3 lock. Meaning we have to truck it all the way back to Tony's terminal to find the password. If, on the other hand, we've already reset Brody's password from Tony's terminal, we can use the new password to log in. Room 201, guest Brody Torrance. June 9th, 2086, regarding the Checkpoint Massacre. From Raider Boss David Thorpe to Brody Torrance. Let me see if I have this straight. Mac Frazier and his entire crew were wiped out by a girl dressed as a comic book character? And you, a young man I've never even heard of, managed to survive and befriend her and convinced her to let you go? That is perhaps the most audacious lie I have ever heard, but very well, I'll play along. We don't have any better leads. Meet with your girl. See what she wants. But I still expect you to make your quotas. Oh no. Brody's girlfriend was not just any young woman. She was a mistress of mystery. She was part of the Order. She betrayed the Order of Mysteries. And for what? Some cute boy? Is that really how this story ends? But wait a minute, we recall the security recording we listened to back at the presidential cottage, and the last word that this young woman said to Brody after he left was, Idiot. She didn't fall in love with him. She was just using him. But why? In the next one, July 1st, quotas. From David Thorpe to Brody Torrance, you're almost 200 caps behind this month, Mr. Torrance. Spending too much time with your new girlfriend... I must say, for all your stories, you certainly don't have much to show for it. We've lost eight more men to mysterious ambushes this week alone. Either she needs to put up, or you do. So Brody was feeling the heat. He needed his new girlfriend to give him something to impress Raider boss David Thorpe. That same month on the 19th, from David Thorpe to Torrance regarding Deal... You can't possibly be serious. I tire of this charade. Rose will dispatch five men to Somersville to set up this ambush of yours. 
you will join them. If your stories are true, if you do manage to kill the girl, return with her head. If not, my men will be returning with yours, one or the other. And here Brody is forced into a life or death situation. If he can't get his girlfriend to help him, if he can't finally defeat a mistress of mystery, David will execute him. Six days later, from David Thorpe to Torrance regarding success, very well, you have my attention. From this point forward, your sole mission will be the elimination of this Order of Mysteries and their assassins. I am promoting you to lieutenant with a team of seven men of your choosing and a private suite in the Black Diamond Lodge. Continue to surprise me and you will be handsomely rewarded. Fail and your star will fall as quickly as it rose. Brody succeeded, likely with support from his girlfriend, and from here on out the mistresses of mystery begin to fall. The next one, on September 13th, from David Thorpe to Brody, regarding the Spruce Knob Ambush. That makes three successful hits. Judging by the reports, they put up quite a fight. It seems these are our mystery assassins. Tell your girl that I accept her offer. If she can deliver her tape, assist us in rooting out this order of mysteries, I'm willing to offer her and you anything that lies within my power to grant, once the job is finished. Her tape? The traitor was delivering Brody a tape? A tape with what? In the next one, September 20th, from David to Brody regarding the mother load. Excellent. I'm sending Tony over to help you analyze the database. Work with him and Rose to map out your ambush plans. We'll pick them off one at a time. And stay the final raid against the manor until we've thinned their numbers. Have Tony begin trawling the data for other leads, too. If their records are as extensive as you say, this could be a tremendous asset. Their records? What, Kryptos? So the holotape the trader was offering to Brody was the entire Kryptos database? Well, that doesn't make any sense. You couldn't fit all of Kryptos on. Wait a minute. In our last episode, the one question we had that was unanswered when we walked away from Sugar Grove was who was the mysterious user who took the second siphon holotape from Sugar Grove? And this must be the answer. It must have been a mistress of mystery. A traitor within the ranks of the Order of Mysteries went to Sugar Grove, retrieved a siphon holotape, and used it to copy Kryptos so she could give it to the raiders. That's how they knew where all of the mistresses of mysteries were. They had access to Kryptos. They could track down each and every one of them. In the final one, on November 16th, from David to Brody regarding the finale. A bit anticlimactic, but it does save us the trouble. Very well, go meet your girl. Make sure there aren't any loose ends. When you get back, report to my office in the top, and we can discuss your future with the cutthroats. A bit anticlimactic? In the last message, he was talking about this big plan for raiding Riverside Manor. But then again, when we find Riverside Manor, sure, there was some burn damage, but we didn't find any bodies there. Did someone else finish off the Mistresses of Mystery besides the Raiders? To confirm our horrifying suspicions and to reveal the identity of the traitor, we need Brody's siphon holotape. A holotape he probably had no idea was incredibly valuable. Backing out of Intramail, we can now access Mount Holotape Drive. Mounting external holotape drive done, loading project siphon holotape done. Readme file found, display readme file, continue. Here's the tape. I've loaded it with my login credentials and a full copy of the database. The mission board lists all of our operations for the next two months. That should give you plenty of potential targets. I need to lay low for a while, stick to the plan. I'll see you when it's time for the final operation. Tell Thorpe I expect him to keep his end of the deal or I'll be coming for his head next. Olivia Rivers. Of course. She's the only member of the Mistresses of Mystery who had an attitude, who had a reason to resent her mother, to resent the Order. She was the headmistress's daughter. She had been taking her mother's orders all of her life. And now as an adult, as a Mistress of Mystery, she'll be taking her orders for the rest of her life. Of course, Olivia is the traitor. But how could Olivia be the traitor? How could she betray her own mother? How could she betray her adopted sisters? Can this story get any more horrible? Clicking the button to continue, we find a very familiar holotape format. Though humorously, the entire Kryptos database took up far less space than the entire Pulsar project. Kryptos is only taking up 41.6 blocks of this holotape, whereas Pulsar took up over 230. 
But in addition to the entire Cryptos database, we find Olivia River's login credentials. If we try to view the Cryptos database, we see that it's everything we're familiar with from Riverside Manor. We can even log in with Natasha Hunt's login credentials, which means this copy was made very late in the timeline of the Order of Mysteries. We can view the job board, view the database. Everything is here. Backing out, we can dispense the siphon holotape. We recall from Kryptos that Shannon's daughter, Olivia Rivers, was one of the few people whose user accounts could grant access to the headmistress's office. Remember when we accepted this job from the job board, Shannon Rivers told us that if we were successful, she wanted to meet with us in person, which means she was waiting in her office for whomever would succeed. But if her own daughter was the traitor, does that mean her office is where they had their final confrontation? So we need to head back to Riverside Manor, log in with Olivia's credentials to grant our user account access to the headmistress's office. But sadly, we're out of time. In our next video, we have the somber task of discovering exactly how deep Olivia's treachery went and discovering the final fate of Shannon Rivers. I publish many Fallout videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you don't want to miss our enthralling conclusion, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs you can't find anywhere else. The shirt comes in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can also find it on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, stickers, mugs, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with the conclusion to the story of the Order of Mysteries.